Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Disruptors in the Culture, where we bring you creative disruptors that we think you should know. And really quick, y'all, if you've ever learned something from us, or if we've simply just made you smile, make sure you've subscribed to the podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Honestly, it costs you nothing, but it helps us to, to continue to grow, as well as have more amazing guests and content for you guys. So I am your co-host, Joshua Meekins, brought to, and here with my amazing co-host, Amira Smith. And we have a very inspirational guest today, and I will let Amira do the introduction of our amazing guest. All right. Today, for Disruptors in the Culture, we have Crystal Bush. She is a name that is known all throughout our region, Philadelphia, and we feel like the world should know about Crystal. First and foremost, how I would describe Crystal is she is definitely a disruptor. She's a social activist, first and foremost, even though she's a creative at her core. But she's one of those amazing people that no matter what she's bringing or whatever business she's doing, because she's an entrepreneur, like she just she always has an entrepreneurial endeavor. She always has a social impact component, but it's not... Some people do it for, okay, I can do this so I can get money or I can get people to like buy into my cause. It usually comes out in the most organic ways. And I, I'm talking about her as if I know her because listen, so much of Crystal's life has been on a documentary that's near and dear to my heart, a woman on the outside. And if you watch this documentary, you're gonna feel like you know her intimately too. I met Crystal. Well, first let's just welcome Crystal to the show. Yeah. And we can talk about how I know her. Hi, Crystal. How you doing Thanks today? Thanks for having me. I'm Great. doing well. I'm doing well. Great. So um, for people who don't know, I, I told Josh this before, and a lot of people I tell them. Um, so I met Crystal years ago. Gosh, I think it was 2017. I met Crystal at um, Mont Brown, had a birthday party. Mm -hmm. And at his birthday party, you know, Mont Brown is also a IHHE or Institute of Hip Hop Entrepreneurship cohort member like me and Tony Chanel, our um, co-founder of uh, Mike J Media. Well, Josh is co-founder to the two co-founders of Mike J Media, who our show was presented by. Um, but Mont had a birthday party. And at the party, he was giving awards to other people. And so at that time, he presented, he did an intro and he presented Crystal with an award, honoring her work with her van service at the time, Bridging the Gap which was a prison van, it was a prison van service, helping loved ones reconnect with their incarcerated um, loved ones. Um, and so at that time, I was just like, wow, this girl is young. And I was like, damn, that's really incredible work. And I just always like, at that time I had wondered, like, I wonder how she got into it. I wonder, you know, what was the catalyst? And then I followed you on social media. And then I was just, you know, like a fan. I was just like, oh man, she's always doing so much great things. Her org is really getting it. And I saw you two were like, you know, raising your nephew. Fast forward a couple of years later, my cousin, Kiara C. Jones, she's a producer. She's in New York. And she said, Amira, I got this new project um, I'm working on. And, you know, we've been working on it for a while. She said, you know, and I want you to take a look at this footage. She says, a Philly story. And I said, yeah, she says this woman, Crystal Bush. And I was like, wait, Critty, Critty B on Instagram. I said, I know her, right? And I was like, yo, she's really great. And then she had me look at the footage. So then from that moment, I started giving input and I became like extra production, like additional production on the film. And then once it completed and it was ready to go out into the world, um, and when it came to Philadelphia to make its premiere here in Philly, I um, became a social impact producer for it. Um, and it's just... It's such a brilliant doc, but like, let's, okay. So with our show, we like to go to the beginnings with um, creators. And so Crystal, I want to start at the beginning for those who don't really know, but also some things I don't know. You're from West Philly. I don't play no set. So <laughs> family's from New York. So childhood grew up, um, no, that's New York, North Philly. Yeah. Okay. Cause you just in New York, yeah. but my family's from North Philly. Um, but really I'm from uptown. So majority of my years, um, was spent uptown, went to Emotep. Um, and then I moved to Winfield, moved to Winfield right after college or while I was actually in college. So, all right. When you were a little girl growing up in uptown, what did you think would be like your career, the type of work you would be doing? Like, how did you picture yourself? 
So um, as a little girl, I always say I wanted to be a social worker, right? Um, and, I, and I chose um, social worker because DHS came into my house and I knew that this particular person was responsible for keeping a family together. Um, when DHS worker came to my house um, and assessed, you know, our house, I was like, oh, you know what? I think I want to be that, you know, because this one lady um, decided whether I was going to stay with my mom or, you know, be removed from my mom. So as young as I as, I, as young as I can remember, I wanted to be a social worker. But of course, once I got to college, you know, my best friends, they're majoring in engineer and, you know, I'm majoring in social work and criminal justice. And when you start looking at the salary and how much you're going to make, mm -hmm. it's not mathing. Like it's not adding up. <laughs> So while I was actually in school, when I was in college, I started my prison band service. So I took a refund check. Um, so took one of my refund checks and that's how I actually bought my first band. So when I was younger, I didn't say, hey, I wanted to you know, go and, and start this prison band service. Um, I seen it as a need because one, my father was locked up since I was like three years old. So you know, being a child of an incarcerated parent um, and just seeing that transportation was a huge barrier and, you know, keeping me connected with my father. It was something that as I'm in my criminal justice classes, I, I seen like, you know, this was really a need and, you know, people really didn't know about it unless you lived it. Um, so, you know, fast forward, my father was locked up since I was three years old, but then all the men in my family were incarcerated too. You know, my, my brother was locked up for 10 years. Um, my oldest brother was in and out of prison. I had cousins that was, you know, serving life. So we were already carpooling um, just in a regular car or a van up to, you know, different prisons. Um, and then I realized that, you know, we were going to like two prisons, but people just started calling, asking about other prisons. And that's when I was like, look, I'm going to take this refund check. You know, I'm going to go to the auction. I think I spent like $7,500 on a van. I got that van when I say, I got the van on like Thursday. On Friday, we were going up to the prisons. The van needed ball joints. When we turned the corner, it was on two wheels. You know, it was like, it, I didn't know. Like, you know, I didn't know. Like, I just thought like, I'm going to go to the auction. I'm going to get this van. And I had like 12 people that wanted to go. So look, I had to go pick these people up, you know, um, and just going up to the prison. Um, I, I would like to say it was like the Uber. It was like really the Uber before Uber yeah. of the prison because people were just calling us and we were go door to door. So you didn't have to meet us at like 30th Street or anything like that. Like we were coming like right to your door, you know, because me, based off of my experience, you know, I remember going to 30th Street as a young girl, early in the morning, we were so cold being on these bands with like all these strangers. And I just felt like if I was to do this, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have little kids just standing on a corner. So, you know, of course it, it took up so much time to like go to, we have 12 passengers. That was sometimes 12 different houses that we were yeah. going to, you know, 12 different neighborhoods going from South Philly to Northeast to West Philly, just all over Philly, just picking people up just because I was, you know, really wanting to do that door-to-door -door service and you know, that was really the mission like i didn't feel that these older women these younger children should be standing on the corner or early in the morning um so i did that uh for what i grew it from going to one prison to 17 state correctional facilities um and i grew it from one van to five vans when i was um done wow so, i yeah. you know i always when I first met you, I wondered it in my mind because I remember a couple of times when I was younger in my like early 20s visiting people in prison, but it was like carpool. So it would be like, oh, pay Keisha $20, pay her $40, you know, to get for the, the there and back. But was it profitable or? So it was, pro it, it is a profitable business, but once I learned, um, it's only profitable if you run it as a nonprofit. So because mm -hmm. I was a social worker, I was able to get to get contracts with the Department of Human Services. So I seen that that was a need. I seen that many children who were in foster care, their fathers was incarcerated. So I was able to meet with many of the judges and say, hey, I have a transportation business. You know, let's court order those children to ride my service to go and visit their incarcerated loved ones. Um, so because I was a social worker, I actually seen that side of the system as well. Um, it was, 
It was profitable once I made it a nonprofit and I was able to get grants, but it was not profitable in a sense where I wasn't able to scale up because the population that we were serving, you know, mm-hmm. you got to think the people who were riding our service, um, you know, many of the women were getting first of the month checks, SSI checks, you know, they was living paycheck to paycheck. They were actually um, really funding this whole bid. So for an from the time that a person was entering into the system. So from lawyer fees to um, paying for phone time, for commissary, mm-hmm. to now paying for transportation. I had some women that wrote my service every weekend, every weekend. And the price was between $50 to like $100. So if you're going to a prison that's five hours away, that was $400 that you was giving me a month just to go every weekend. Um, so just in my heart, I couldn't scale up on them, you know, just yeah. knowing where I'm dropping them off at. I'm dropping them off, you know, in neighborhoods and, and, and projects. Like, I can't scale up on those type of people. Um, so it wasn't profitable in a sense where if I only kept it where uh, the passengers who was riding the service was paying, um, no, it was hard to scale up. And I didn't realize to turn the van service into a nonprofit until, like, what 2017 yeah and from there i was already in business for like what five years wow that's you, incredible what was the the most difficult thing about the van service like running it the most difficult um was just my mental you know my mental was the most difficult and i didn't realize it because i think We're like, you know, we're taught to like grind and hustle and hustle. And like, you know, many times, like even when you met me at Mont Brown, getting these different awards and these accolades, and it's just like, you know, you're receiving all this recognition, but no one is telling you to slow down. Like no one is telling you to take a break and take a pause. And I didn't realize I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for the burnout. It was a burnout that happened. And I didn't like, we, we don't talk about burnout in our community. You know, we just talk about hustle, 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 grind, 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 keep going, keep going. And just that type of business, because it was so like close to my trauma with all of, all of the men in my family being incarcerated. And it wasn't just a business that I was in to just make money. It's like, I started looking at the system from a different angle and I'm like, whoa, like this prison system like really disrupted and messed up our entire community you know i started even questioning if i was even solving a problem because yeah i'm able to build this community of women um and i used to tell the men like if it was not for me these women wouldn't be riding up on the service like they were only riding because i made it a thing like i made it a community for these women to feel seen like even outside of the prison we were we were organizing different events um, I would, you know, get back to Philly and say, hey, y'all want to go to the bar? All right, we're going to take <laughs> take, <laughs> take your knee cobs and stuff or we're going to the bar. Like, we were really like a community. Um, and that's something that they didn't see. I really say, like, just my mental, like, even as I started to pull back and hire drivers, I would be back home just pacing back and forth, you know, just worrying if the van got in, if everyone on the van got in um, without... Um, and turned around worrying if you know the van was safe on a road um because you know we're, we were driving to upstate prisons which was like four or five hours away where it's sunny here in philly but when you go you know on the other side of, of pennsylvania it's snowing they're going through blizzards so a lot of that caused so much anxiety for me and um it just forced me to shut down so that was really like the hardest it was just like really learning how to just take care of myself while I was like running this type of, of, of service. I think to add to that, like even to your point, like not only are you just like an entrepreneur and you created a business, you're also a therapist, you're a community leader. You're also dealing with your own experiences with this being it so close to you. Speaking of that burnout, like what did you even, how did you even know you got to that point? Like how did you even know you were burnt out? So, before I even got to the burnout, it was a sense of guilt, you know, taking on the responsibility of caring for my nephew, right? Because, you know, my brother was locked up. His mom was um, in and out of prison as well. And I, re- I remember one football season, I missed all of my nephew games, you know, and I was like, I'm going to make it to your banquet. Like, I missed your whole season, but I'm going to make it to your banquet, right? And bore his outfit, you know, bore the outfit. 
And I thought the banquet was on Sunday. I'm on a roll on Saturday. And he like, I sure day. Like, my banquet was today. When I say that crushed me, it crushed me. Like, it broke, like, it broke me. Mm-hmm. And that's when I realized, like, th- he deserves a present parent, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started, like, revisiting, like, how I was running this service. And I started hiring, you know, people to to drive the vans. But it was, like, looking back at how many of how much time I put into this business and was apart from him, you know, just missing his whole football season. I'm like, no, mm -mm." that hit me so hard. I felt so guilty. Um, And that's when I really just started like, really like saying like, look, I got to take care of myself because I got to be able to take care of my nephew. Um, So it was, it was really at that moment where I'm like, he deserves a present parent and just present, not even in a sense of me just always grinding. Like even when I'm home, I'm, I'm sleeping because I'm always on a roll. Like he deserves me to be my best self so I can pour into him. So it was more so me looking at my nephew and realizing like, OK, yes, you think that he needs this parent that is financially stable and is grinding, but he also needs a present parent. You know, you decided to take on this responsibility. You decided to move forward and adopt him. You cannot be like his parents. You can't be like anybody else that's just in and out of his life. Um, So it was really my nephew that, like, really forced me to, like, slow down um, just to be more present, you know, in his life. Man, wow. What, um, I guess... Because I know there was a time where you ended up stepping away, but at that time, what really kept you going? Was it just like you? Did you feel like I can't stop now? I, even when even when you were having your melt, like your, I guess like your breakdown and your burnout, did you feel like I can't stop for the people that I'm serving, or what kept you going in it? Because I, so it was like this sense of like I built this community, so it's like how can I build this community and just like walk out on them, you know? Um, and what kept me going was the phones kept ringing. Like, even now, I'll go on Facebook. They're asking me, am I going to the prison? Like, <laughs> you know, it's it's crazy. Like, even on Instagram, hey, you still ride the dance? Or, like, oh, like in your DMs. Ride? Yeah. In my DMs. So that's what, it kept me going because it, it was a need-based business. Like, it's like, you know, people are continuously getting locked up. So, and they're yeah. looking for this service. So the fact that I see like so many people were like counting on this service and needed this service, that's really what kept me going in the community that I built. But it was really when when my loved ones came home, like when my dad, my brothers, when they came home, just going up to the prisons and just being outside of the prisons, you know, crying and just being so emotional and just like, I wish they hurry up and get out of here. Like the ladies didn't know what I was going through outside. But yeah, it was it was tough. It was it was it was it was it was rough for me. Um, and one day I just was like, I'm done. Like I just cut off, like I, I sent out a mass text and said, Hey, I will no longer be doing this service anymore. And I shut my phone off for probably like two weeks. Hmm. Wait, you mean like turned it off? Like I just turned it off and didn't turn it back on. And wow. that was like the Ooh. most peace that I got. Like, <laughs> cut it off. like I don't, I don't want to do this. Like just like up the one day. Yeah. Like, no, it's, it's a, it, like, this is not a question. It's not a suggestion. It's a complete sentence with a period. I'm done. Like, that's brave. Cause, yeah. ooh, that, yeah, you had to be yeah. definitely at that breaking point where mm-hmm. you like, uh uh-uh, uh, I don't even want to hear a sob story. I don't want to hear a please. You like, no begging. I'm, I'm, I, 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 have thought, to, I, get out I here. thought I would <laughs> pass it on, like, okay, I'll just let the, you know, the drivers, you know, run it. And that's how it was. Yeah. But even from that, it was like, I still, you know, was attached to it. So I just, at that point, I just, I just didn't want no one else to just lean on me. Like, I just need to pour into my family that just came home from prison, you know, um, and I'm just trying to navigate that. I'm trying to learn how to be this daughter to, yeah. you know, my father that had been locked up for 25 years. I'm learning how to be this baby mom to my brother, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, it was just, I was just trying to navigate so much just outside or like running this service where it's like I had to shut this down because if I didn't, I felt like something bad was going to happen, you know. And I think a lot of times, you know, just even in our community, like we have many leaders that are leading us, but no one took a break. Like, you know, they're yes. just leading us tirelessly, tirelessly and it's no break or, you know, it's, it's no pause. 
And I think that is so important for us to, you know, be brave enough to say like, you know what, I'm not well, and I cannot continue to run this service. And if I do, someone's going to die. Mm-hmm. And, and that was just the reality of it. It's like, I can't, like, I'm not well enough to continue this service because, you know, I'm not in my right state of mind. Yeah. Yes, the money is flowing. Yes, you know, I'm getting partnerships and all of these accolades, but none of that meant well, nothing because I internally wasn't well. Wow. I think too, like, so just to give a little color to people listening, all of this is seen in the documentary. Like you kind of get sitting like right next to Crystal throughout the entire documentary of all, as all of this stuff is happening. So you're seeing the band service, you know, grow. You're seeing her relationships with her families blossom and develop and go through their stages as well. And it's, it's, it's really like, it's literally like you're sitting there and walking with you through each of these phases. And you brought up uh, a few different things, especially about your family coming home, which was beautiful to see in the documentary. You could see all the, the, the great moments that you guys have and all the struggles too as well. And one of the things that really stood out and that you mentioned too is like you, you building the relationship with your father. Like you had mentioned earlier too, like he had been in jail since you were young and then you're now starting to build a new relationship. And one of the things I remember in the documentary you guys were on a phone call and he had said like, yeah, like you can't make up for that time. You kind of got to move on. Yeah. That's what you got to do. And to kind of really see you, him come home and want to be your biggest cheerleader, do whatever it takes to, to, to be with you. And, and you do the same with him. How was it building a relationship with your father at that time? Like really kind of from scratch. Yeah. I'm, I'm thankful that the, I'm thankful for the time that I did get um, and even just shut down a van service because I feel like if I would have kept going, um, I wouldn't have been able to be present and build in that relationship, you know? And when I say I was like a little girl, like I was like a little girl, you know, just, you know, doing a lot of things for the first time. Like I'm in a hair salon, my, my dad bringing me lunch, you know, like my dad coming home and even just the relationship that we built while he been out, like it just changed just my whole perspective of just dating, you know, just having a man just show up for you. Like, I don't got to change a light bulb in here, like nothing. Like my dad don't want me to lift a finger. And I think that's what every girl deserves. And that's what I was missing for so many years. So just understanding like, okay, you know, my dad opening doors for me, like just the little things that, you know, that's raised by a single parent. We, we don't, we don't see that. We just see the strong black woman that's doing everything on her own. And then we go out and we do the same thing. Whereas, you know, having my dad come home and just set the standard, you know, forget all the time that, you know, he missed, like, he didn't make up, like he, he couldn't make up for that lost time. But just from that point on, like from since he been out to now, like he been showing up in every aspect. Like nice I don't gotta anything that I call this man for, he is showing up. And like I said, he set the bar high and is he making it a little difficult for a lot of these guys out here. <laughs> Listen, every <laughs> every local hard. screening, her dad is there. And it's not That's and it's good. it's crazy because it's like he's a huge part of the documentary. But he's not even there to like, hey guys, I'm here. He be in the side and he just be like, oh, I'm just here for her. Like mm-hmm. he's really just there to support Crystal as a proud dad, you know? And yeah. when they ask him like, no, come to the Q, come up here to Q and A and talk. Like, he's just like, no, no, no. Or he'll just be like, I'm just grateful I got my time with my little girl. And he's yeah. like, and I just want to do right. And you know, it's just like, wow. Like he just, he's a dad, like you know. And you're just like, yeah. damn. He's a dad and, and I'm happy that, you know, I just had this time to like just work on our relationship because I think before he got out, I was so hard on him on what mm-hmm. I thought he needed to do. Like, I felt like I had like this home plan for all the all of the men in my family. Like I had this van like that they were going to turn into a mobile car detailing shop. You know, I'm, I was on my dad like, why didn't you get your GED or why didn't you do this? Because I had this picture in my mind that in order for him to be successful out here, he had to do this, 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 this. And although, you know, he didn't do the mobile car detailing, like he found what he wanted to do, you know. And when I say my dad helps all of my friends, like my friends can be buying investment properties. My dad is there, you know, laying up the sheetrock. My dad, you know, like he just, he, he don't not only show up for me, but like all of my friends he show up for. Like, you know. If they need a light bulb change, let me call my dad. Like, you know. That's so nice. So, yeah. It's so nice. Man. So, okay. 
the documentary for people. I mean, I guess people listening or, or watching, they should have a sense of what the documentary is about. It's um, a woman on the outside. It started as a photo a journalism project. Um, it grew out of a photojournalism project called um, Everyday Incarceration. And the two directors, Lisa and Zara, they somehow got in contact. How did Lisa and Zara um, find you? Did they, someone refer them to you, Crystal? No, so on Instagram, you yeah. know, um, I was actually following their page. They were following Bridget and Gats page, Everyday Incarceration. So we would like each other um, stories. And they, they slid in a DM and it was like, hey, uh, we see that you are having this um, this cookout, this family event for your, your riders. We're thinking about coming down. I did not think these ladies was going to come down. I'm in the middle of the hood. I'm like, they not going to come down. And <laughs> boy, did they, they came down with these cameras. And I was like, oh, my God, everyday incarceration. You guys came. Um, so they came to the family day that I had. It was at, in the Huntington Park. And that's the and one you see in the film. Yeah, yes. That's so cool. that's the first time that I met them. And they were like, okay, we got our footage. And I'm like, that's it? Like, this is nothing. Like, this is just showing the joy. Like, this is not showing, like, what what it is that we, that we go through on these band rides. Um, I was like, that's what y'all wanted? Like, y'all just wanted to come and capture this joy? I said, I don't, I don't think that that's, like, that's it. Like, y'all got to get on the van. Like, in order to capture, like, the true emotions of with these families and, and what I go through, like, y'all got to ride the van. So they ended up riding a van. Yeah, we went to a prison. I didn't take them to a prison that was five hours away. We actually went to a prison that was, like, three hours away. And they were... Just interviewing me while people were inside, they were exhausted. Like, you know, Lisa hates that I tell this story, but as she was interviewing me in a van, she had the mic over top of the seat. And, you know, we both laying down and we're just talking. And I was just talking for like five minutes. And I was like, Lisa, you there? And she fell asleep on me in the middle of the interview. Wow. <laughs> She's like, I don't know how you do this. She's going to kill me for telling that story. But, <laughs> you know, like just for her to ride this van. And it's like, this is something that we're doing Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Like continuously going to 17 prisons. For them to get on this van and be exhausted, that's the side that I see. Like, oh, wait, this is not normal. You know, mm -hmm. even talking to Zara and really just being transparent. She's just asking questions like, wait how much do you guys pay for phone time? And I'm like, you don't know? Like, you know, like that's when I'm like, wait, this is not normal. Like, wait, Zara, you don't know the difference between a prison and, you know, a jail and, yeah. you know, things like that is what opened my eyes and wanted me to just, um, just tell them like, y'all gotta just keep riding. Like, you know, because we gotta get this out there. Like we, we gotta get like these, these, the, these women's stories out there and just show this side of um, the system. Yeah, so Zara and Lisa, um, both being a journalist that they were, they were getting all the stories of the women, getting Crystal's story. And at first the film was kind of like, just this like tapestry about women on the outside with their, you know, male loved ones and everyone, them going to go visit. And then, um, and Zara and Lisa, uh, Zara Katz, Lisa Riordan Seville, they're both white women. And then they were looking for a producer because they try to take it out because this was their first film, right? They're both journalists, first film. And then they were like, oh, we think they're ready. And someone I think suggested like, you might need a producer help you shape it up. So somehow they got referred to Kiara C. Jones, my cousin. And Kiara saw, and you know, Kiara's a black woman. So she was like, hmm. She said she was looking at the footage and she was like, okay, like I see where y'all are going. And then she was like, okay, so tell me more about Crystal. And when they were saying it, and it's just like, wait, her, her father's incarcerated. Her brother's incarcerated. She's like, actually, she's the film. She said she's the film. The other women can be also a backdrop and vignettes brought in. And then it's like, as soon as um, she said, like, do, would she give us access? And they said, when Lisa and Zara approached um, you, Crystal, and they were like, you did, you were like, sure. And it just was like, they always say, I mean, and it is something like the access Crystal gave them is like a gift. And it was just, honest too like it wasn't and it, i guess it's like i wonder if it's generational because it wasn't like crystal was holding back anything she wasn't um even posturing becoming some you know putting on airs or trying to like present differently like she just really let them in and so vulnerable and so much like even in the film crystal has a um she has a, a 
a cinematography credit because so much is her with her cell phone capturing things when they weren't there. A lot of it is a lot of her old um, like cell phone footage that they use. Of course, when you see her nephew growing up through the years, how so? Let me let me see because I had a question about this this vulnerability. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. did you have okay? So first when they first was like. Did you have well now is now I see that you guys were already fans of each other's work. So there was no hesitation for them to come there. But once they turned to focus on you, did you have any hesitation when you were like, I'm gonna let you into my home and my life and you meet my mom? So at first I really I was directed up to talk to like all the I'm like, no, talk to them, talk to them. Um because you know, I felt like this service really was about the the women that wrote my service. Not that I didn't think that I had a story, you know. Yeah. I just was like, no, her story, her 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 brother is actually the oldest person that's at this prison. You know, like I was really directing them to talk to almost like everybody but me. Just because, you know, like I'm looking at me and I'm like, I'm fine. Like I don't, my family coming home. Like, you know, I didn't think that the story should have been a, 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 like about me. And especially like my nephew until things just started happening. Like, you know, we didn't really know, like, like we said, it was really supposed to just be photos. Like, let's take these pictures of these different people that's writing a service, these different ladies that's writing a service, get their stories. And it was going to be a photo exhibit. Right. Um, I didn't know like the different life obstacles that was going to start happening. And, it became a point where like they were actually sometimes like my first point of contact, like not even 911. I was calling Lisa and Zara, like, you know, that's how close we got. And it's, and it's because we built that trust. Like it wasn't forced, you know, it wasn't like, even before Kiara came on and said, Hey, the film is going to be about you. We already had that trust. I was already yeah. calling like Lisa. I don't know what to do, girl. Like they not letting us in this prison. Like what should we do? Like how can you read this over? Like you know, like we built like a bond already. Um, they became like allies for us. Like imagine having two white women show up and go to court. You know, for you like and sitting in court. Like I remember my ex boyfriend and they cut him out. And I'm happy they did, but they cut my ex-boyfriend out. My ex-boyfriend was, <laughs> he was um he was going to trial, you know, in the feds. And his trial was for like, it was like for like 25 days, right? Mm -hmm. And I just remember the respect that I got just having Lisa and Zara there as opposed to when they weren't there. So mm -hmm. just having these two, you know, white women just be allies in this court system that I know that if they weren't there, they would be treating me so much different. Um, and, you know, once I, once I realized that, you know, I would really just, you know, turn to Lisa just for advice, you know, um, and then it just started becoming second nature. You know, my brother was murdered. It was like, girl, my brother just was murdered. I need y'all here right now. And it was like, wait, before we get there, turn your camera sideways, zoom, like, you know, it was, I was even calling them before calling 911, which is wow, but that's just the the type of trust that I, I that we have built over the years, yeah. um, and it wasn't just about um, it wasn't just about like just for the documentary. It was like I felt safe, you know. I felt safe when I called them to hear their input. Like, what should we do, you know, in this case? And that like, makes sense yeah. with them being journalists because sometimes yeah, you call nine one one, but. And you're, you might say, they say, like, get the footage because sometimes you need that to present to 911, you know, mm -hmm. and, and them as journalists thinking about, OK, what do you need? You will need this as evidence, but also just like have this in the story. Um, this was a so that documentary was over eight years. Was it eight years of filming or does it is it eight years going back, adding like some archival footage that you already had? No, it was like eight years of filming wow. <laughs> because at first, this is the thing. We didn't know what we were doing in the beginning, you know, in the beginning, like you got to think for two, three years, I was directing them to talk to everybody but me. Wow. And then once those cameras turned on to me, I was like, uh, okay, you know, I guess I have a story. Um, but, you know, the first three years, it was really the women. And my only act was, I, let's just save the integrity. Like, I do not want this to be the next reality show. This was a time where everybody was pitching reality shows. And I'm like, please, like, this cannot be a reality show. 
you know, yeah. and then like even the women that wrote my service, like they trusted me. So, you know, when Lisa and Zara came on the van, like I gave them a heads up, you know, some women didn't want to be on camera. All right, well, you can't ride this weekend. You got to ride next weekend, you know? Yeah. So, you know, and some women, like they felt like, okay, my husband or my son is, is, is doing some time and this may shed light on his issue. So many people were open to sharing their stories. So they have tons of footage just they can make a whole nother documentary just with the other footage that they have with just all of the other women. Wow. wow. They wrote I the service. You can you can really sense the trust that you got that everyone had throughout the entire documentary as well, especially the, a lot of the intimate moments that it was shared. I think from a filmmaking mindset, like that's beautiful that they came in and, you know, were very transparent with you. You were transparent with them and it allowed the the story to really flourish because you could see that. You got the the moments, like you said, when your brother was murdered, as well as the rest of the moments as far as the, your interaction with your nephew and, you know, the joy that you had when the, the process of adoption was over. Like those are those are things that people don't normally get to view and see. But I also want to say, like, for you to even have the judgment to say, yeah, welcome into my life and you're going to either take it the way it is or you're not going to film at all. Like that is also another mm -hmm. a, a, a testament to you and your courage and your ability to say, you know what, this story needs to be told. This is bigger than me. Let me go ahead and really kind of, you know, put some light on this issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think because I get that question a lot, like, how were you able to be so vulnerable? And I just feel like that's just me. Like, you know what I mean? I always yeah. like since I was since I was younger, I always felt like I am, God is using me as a vessel. Mm. So I have to shed light on some on issues that certain people will hide. You know, I, I have to say like, you know, my father is incarcerated, you know, like this has happened. I have to show, you know, like even today I posted on my story, like I'm in therapy. Like I have this thing where I post like therapy chronicles, you know, and now people are like, oh my God, how did you find your therapist? Like I show I show things that some people just would like be like, oh, I, I can never show that part because I feel like this may help the next person, you know? So that just always been me to show like little bits of pieces of like just vulnerable parts of me. And that's how I really build community. You know, I'm very transparent with the community that I build um, and just showing like just different p pieces. And that's how you really connect to people. If I show up, as perfect, like, you know, then that going to do for this community as opposed to, you know, let me show you that I'm, I'm healing. Let me show you this is how I'm getting through it. Let me show you that I'm in therapy. Um, you know, let me share some of my truth. Let me show the behind the scenes of my business and how it's hard, you know. So I've always been like that. So it's just like when Lisa and Zara came, they just came with bigger cameras. Like yeah. I just went from having my iPhone 5 to now we got these big cameras. Yeah. And, you know. That's <laughs> and, dope. It's crazy because so. when I wait, so when my when you, Mont Brown given that award twenty seventeen, were you guys were you already in contact with Lisa and Zara as far as and were you guys already doing like whether it was the doc yet or the photojournalism? Yeah, because they were they were already coming to my family events. Already. Ah, okay. And, and around that time, it, the documentary was never about me. It was like, oh, they're just yeah. shooting a documentary about my van service. Okay, so. that, okay, because I'm thinking like, wow, time wise. But it was so funny when Kiara first told me. I was like, "Oh yeah, Critty B." I said, "Oh, she she was she was adopting her nephew." I said, and it happened because I remember because Crystal would put everything on social. You know, most of the stuff you saw, like all those clips, it was already on social media. And so I remember, like, some a couple people who knew, like, my homegirl Nisa. We were like, "Oh my god!" And I remember seeing your video, and I was tearing up watching the video. Like, "Oh my god, the adoption went through." I was like, "Oh my goodness!" And then I was, but when Kira said, "I said she adopted her nephew," I said, "Oh, she had the van service." I said, "She real fly." I was like, "She oh, she be dressing like," <laughs> and, and I was so glad for that part that they showed that in the doc because I was mm -hmm. like, they don't know she puts it on. And she goes yeah. out and it's it's like people who don't like if you you will do yourself a disservice if you don't watch this documentary, number one, 100%. because we know incarceration touches whether people know it or not. It touches every human on this planet, you know, and especially for Philadelphians like um, the United States has the highest incarceration rates, I mean, rate per capita. And then Pennsylvania. It's one of the highest incarceration rates. So especially Philadelphia, we have a concentration. We're one of the most incarcerated cities on the planet. Mm -hmm. You know, um, only I think 
like parts of Asia are only like second or third behind us. But so Philly is, this is such a, it's like such a Philly story. And there's a lot of Philadelphians, especially like a lot of white Philadelphians. They don't, it just doesn't touch their lives the same. Like even this one part where when you're going back to the prison, you're like, I don't even think I have a, a prison bra anymore. And in that moment, I thought, I know so many people who are watching it who do not understand what she means. Because it's like when you go to visit a prison, you cannot have an underwire in your bra. And so it's like little things like that, that this is, there's so much nuance in it. But it's such a good film. And I was so glad that they showed the joyful and like the free young crystal too, to give people the duality. Um, but, you know, you guys don't have to take it in LeVar, LeVar Burton's old words. You don't have to take it from me. Um, mm -hmm. A Woman on the Outside has won a lot of awards. It's been an official selection of many, many film festivals. It world, it world premiered South by Southwest in 2022. It won Best Documentary at the 2022 ABFF Award Festival. So we're talking the American Black Film Festival, Best North American Feature Documentary at the Mammoth Lakes Film Festival, Best Doc at Diamond State Black Film Festival, Honorable Mention for Humanitarian Excellence at the Woods Hole Film Festival, won the Audience Award at the Philadelphia Film Festival, was an official selection of Atlanta's Film Fest, Maryland's Film Fest, Docklands, and it is available to stream for free until the end of 2024 on PBS. Um, so this PBS, like the literal website, um, World Channel's website, and also on YouTube under World Channel's YouTube station um, or YouTube channel. So part of what you said you earlier, you totally, you like you kind of burnt out on the van service. So in honor of your next chapter, I wore a Bob Marley t-shirt because Bob Marley for me growing up um, in the eighties, he was one of the first people that I heard talk about legalizing marijuana. And so for your next chapter after the van service, um, you went into like a really, once again, another very social impact heavy venture. Um, was it super intentional for you to become a new, I guess, like a big voice in advocacy for marijuana legalization, but your next venture, Free My Weed Man? And like, so what is Free My Weed Man and what inspired you? Like, did you start it or are you like, you know, and do you have partners? Because before Bridging the Gap, people knew that's Crystal Bush and, you know, you had help. But with Free My Weed Man, how is like, what is it for the people who don't know? Yeah, so I'll just take it like back a little bit. Free My Weed Man is actually my third business in the cannabis oh. industry. <laughs> so I shut down, you know, the van service, right? And I entered the cannabis space more so as a patient. So here it is. I didn't know what my next journey was going to be. Google, you know, how to how to get well. And it was the gym and it was therapy. So I started going to therapy. I was diagnosed with PTSD and anxiety. And my therapist, of course, wanted to give me um, medication. And I was like, well, I do consume and it makes me feel good. Um, and that's what my therapist told me. Like, well, you know, you know, in Pennsylvania, you can get your medical marijuana card. So that's where I learned. Like, I didn't even know that we can even get our medical marijuana card. And once I got my medical marijuana card and I started going to the dispensaries and I started getting all these different strands and just being intentional about consuming um, I started, you know, helping my friends, not my, my, cause I'm the only one in my friend group that smokes, but like I started building this community. So some of the women that wrote the service, you know, I started telling them, you know, here it is. I got my medical marijuana card, like, girl, you got to get yours. So I started again, organize a, a community of women, started helping them just get their medical marijuana cards or started connecting them with doctors. Um, and really just, you know, teaching them about the medicinal benefits as I was learning it as well. So I thought that I was going to enter into the cannabis industry and take my vans and now have a delivery service, right? So started taking patients to the um, dispensaries. Um, but then I started realizing like, whoa, like you only can have a certain amount of flour in, or products in a mm. car before it's illegal. So learning that um, and learning it here in Pennsylvania, they're not even giving out any more licenses. That's when I started like just doing my research. So now when know, you say licenses for like marijuana businesses or. Yes. 
Is so that here, in, here, like yeah, here in Pennsylvania, um, it's still cannabis is still is, is illegal. I mean, cannabis is legal um, medicinally, right? Okay. Yeah. So it's not open, you know, to anybody just getting a license. So they actually put a cap on um, the amount of licenses. So delivery was not one of them. Um, and as I started like hiring lawyers and I started learning like, whoa, it's a lot to get into this industry. Like I just thought I was going to be able to change the wrap of my vans, now put a <laughs> cannabis brand. And I was just so surprised, you know? So uh, essentially I thought I was going to start a delivery service. That was the whole goal. Like, okay, take these vans, do a delivery service, boom. Right. Um, so I started organizing this community and having these like patient pop-up parties, like at secret locations. So people would come, you know, and I'll have a doctor on site. So, you know, here it is, like everybody in here, they're patients. Like this is a safe place for patients to consume. Yeah. So having these events at secret locations, um, and I was having an event like what, once a month, you know, just going, going, going. So that was actually my second business into yeah. the cannabis industry. Then from there, I'm like, we're, I'm moving my community around. Like we need a stable space. Like we need one place, right? So I built out a CBD cafe um, and during the pandemic, built out a CBD cafe, um, had a soft opening. And after that soft opening, I started receiving emails from city council. I started, you know, just really, I got pushed out. Like it was like, Ooh. you cannot open up this business. I did not approve of you to open up this business, you know, in my district. Um, and from there, I just got so frustrated. So I was high, I was high one day. It was like two o'clock in the morning. I was like, man, free my effing weed, man. And I was like, wait, ah. free my weed, man. <laughs> so no, I did not think that I was gonna be um, back in to advocacy. Like I really just thought that I was gonna be in wellness. Um, I thought I was going to just be having a delivery service, but here it is. I'm on the front lines um, and, and I'm advocating for, you know, folks that have been locked up for, you know, for cannabis and even just people who just been impacted by this war on drugs. You know, yes. I think the longer that I've been, you know, just studying cannabis, I even just went recently back and got my master's in cannabis science and business because like. I just needed to like study, like what, where do we go wrong? You know? Yeah. And once I realized that, you know, our government intentionally created a war on drugs that sent black and brown people to prison, um, and ended up in, you know, many of our families being, you know, sent to prison, the result ended up in, in the gun violence, the spike in gun violence that we currently see. Um, it just fueled my, my passion to just go harder and just fight harder. Um, because I, I, I understand the root cause and how we got to where we are now. Whereas before, I felt like with the van service, that was just adding a band-aid to, the, to yes. the problem, you know? And that's why I was getting like that uncertainty, like, am I solving a problem? Because this problem was so much bigger. And now I feel like with Free My Weed, man, I'm actually attacking that root. Um, I'm actually, you know, helping draft language. So that language... Um, it's benefiting and ensuring that the tax revenue is going back to the communities that are directly harmed um, by this war on drugs. But it's hard, you know, it's, it's tough. So for a long time, you know, I didn't really take ownership for Free My Weed Man. So Free My Weed Man, yes, it's mine. It's only mine. Um, I don't have no partners. But I didn't take ownership because you know, one, a fear, you know, fear yeah. that I'm up against this, like this system, you know, and it's little me. So I had like, you want to know who, who was behind Free My Weed Man. Like, you know, I was interviewing like just different people that's on a legacy side and you may think that it's his. Yeah. And I like it like that, you know, just to protect me because like when I'm organizing these rallies and I'm on these front lines, like, I, I still need protection. Like, you know, we like we need protection. Like we're we're up against a systemic like issue. Like and just little of me, I, I need protection as I, I really fight for this while I'm on the front line. So free my weed man, yes, it's it's me. Um, but it evolved. It started off as a hashtag that went viral to a streetwear brand, yes. um, to now an advocacy organization where we draft language and 
Um, we, you know, ensure that those funds are going to be directed back into our communities. And it's my wildest dream because I just thought that I was going to get into this industry and just, you know, be more on wellness. But it's like it's hard to be on this side and just focus on your business and not be an advocate at the Absolutely. same time. Absolutely. Boy, um, how how do people in the community how can they get involved with Free My Weed Man? Definitely tap in. Uh, y'all can email me. We are look, organizing a street team currently. Uh, but even, you know, as we organize these rallies, show up. You know, even if you can't show up, like, mention us. Like, it's so heartbreaking how many organizations I reached out to who just do not even want to come to a policy breakfast because they don't want to be seen in, in a room that's being talked about with cannabis, you know? So really just- um, Do you have like a, um, do you do like email email newsletters? Like if people will go to your website and they can subscribe. Mm -hmm. I, and I'm gonna say this, y'all, the, the, the streetwear is fire. Like it gives like cactus plant flea market vibes. Like it's, the streetwear is good. The free my yeah. weed man stuff, Thank you me. know? So it's like, even if you guys go and buy, but um, that's another thing, like we, we're seeing it in real time, how it's so hard for black and brown people to enter the market while it's being legalized, while there's dispensaries. I know, and, and so Josh is from, and he still lives in New Jersey, so they're mm -hmm. recreational over there. So mm -hmm. their dispensaries are doing their thing, but- It's it's crazy. And I think, I'm, I'm so happy, Crystal, you brought up the whole system, the systemic portion of it, because that's the part I think that New Jersey is really trying to figure out. And I can't, I haven't, like, I used to be a little more on top of this, but they're really trying to figure out like ways to make sure that it's evenly distributed, that the licenses can be evenly distributed. I have a friend who's actually um, a coworker who's <laughs> about to open up a weed dispensary in Northern New Jersey. And like, I'm, I'm really hoping that more people advocate, like you're saying, or, or talk about it, talk about its uh, medical uses, and it becomes something that's less frowned upon, but more seen as a tool. Just because I've known athletes, I've known people with mental health, mental health issues who this is something that is a benefit for them. But I think that it was it's been criminalized, obviously systemically, and it has such had such a negative effect for Black and Brown people over the years yes. that now there's a lot of you know stigma on it. One and then two, there's so much healing that needs to be done in our community just strictly based off of this. So um, I think I'm, I've learned for the first time from Amira sharing your story. And the stuff going on with Free My Weed Man, um, that you know, but the stuff you're doing is super important. Um, I think how so was it just you kind of doing your own research that, that educated you about the system uh, systemic uh, issues that are going on with it, or was that something that, that you learned more in getting your master's? Like where did it like, really? So from? no, just like so when my when my brother passed away, right? Yeah. Um, I started looking at his docket sheets, you know, okay. and. When I looked at his docket sheets, I seen that some of his earlier charges was he was arrested for illegal substances. Uh -huh. So I think when we say free my weed, man, it's not even just the person that's currently incarcerated. Yeah. A person could be incarcerated right now for murder or for a violent for a violent crime. But we got to understand that their earlier charges back in the 90s and the 80s is resulted they suffer from the collateral consequences yeah. so imagine not getting housed and imagine not being able to go to school imagine not being able to get a good paying job to provide for your family it's going to lead you to robbery or some of the serious yeah. violent charges like that's the and that's that was the intentionality of this yeah. whole war so i think we got to go back to when i say like go back to the root once we go back to the root and as to, you know, start looking at some of our families, you know, that's in and out of the system mm -hmm. and looking at their earlier charges. It's not going to say that they were incarcerated for cannabis. No, it's going to say yeah. illegal substance. Yeah. So I even, you know, went as far as like ordering like the docket sheets and the court the court um, reports and really realized like, oh, my, my brother was locked up for marijuana. So that's wow. like part of the reason why I go so hard, too, because, yes, he was murdered by his his girlfriend. But he also went years suffering from the collateral consequences, not being able to, prov per to provide for his family. Then I went back and I looked at the living conditions that my brother was living in, like him, his girlfriend and four of four of their kids is living in one room. Like mm -hmm. somebody was going to take somebody here at all. You know what I mean? So it's like we got to look at just the, the issues. I think a lot of what's happening is and, and I think that's 
that's what this war have done. It divided us so much where people who is advocating and fighting for gun violence, they're scared to attach their 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 work to cannabis because guess what? They're going to lose funding. So the system wow. is designed to keep us separated. It's like you matter of fact, right now, I don't even want you talking about cannabis because if you do, guess what? You're going to lose your funding. Mm -hmm. But then I just seen that three million dollars here in Pennsylvania just went to law enforcement to train law enforcement on how to criminalize us. Yeah. So it's like they're training law enforcement on how to criminalize us. But yet our, the organizations that's in our community can't even like talk about it. So I think we got to really just go deeper and um, really just understand that it's the system that, you know, that just that's putting us apart. And, and many of us, we are in roles. Like I remember even as a social worker, I was in a role. I was trained to go to the hospital to remove the child if mom was smoking weed. Like many of us wow. are are in these system, or, or, I mean, are in these positions yeah. that, you know, like where we got to go with the agenda. Like we're trained to do that. Um, and I think that's where just having values, you know, like really just sticking to and understanding like what our value systems are and really leaning into that. Like, you know, I think people don't realize how deep it really is and the effects, the, the, the decades and decades and decades of effects that it's had on our community. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. You let me know about when this, um, when this uh, Black Cannabis Week is, which I hope you could talk about a little bit now, <laughs> and I want to make sure that I, you know, I'm in attendance because that's it, it. It's great work, honestly. Yeah, so I give credit to the reason why I'm in the cannabis industry is because I attend the Black Cannabis Week, um, and the founder of Black Cannabis Week is Sharon Perry Thomas. Um, this is actually her seventh year uh, doing this, and it's in partnership with Senator Street. Um, it happens at Temple University at their medical school. Um, and this year she allowed me to bring these uh, Rooted in Justice uh, Film Festival uh, to the conference as well. But just helping her, like once you see Sharon, Sharon is like this little, you know, old lady. Um, and like, you know, I just felt like I had to give back and I had to support her and I had to, you know, see how I can like um, work with her to like, bring this conference more like an unconference model like you know it's it's not like where it's panels where we're going to be talking at you it's like it's, it's really interactive you know so having can a family feud having you know a doctor there that's going to be you know um having a doctor there that's going to be like giving people free medical marijuana cards, of, of course, but then also having office, office hours for lawyers. So many people that's on the legacy side, they this is their opportunity to meet with lawyers for free, you know, to learn how to trademark their business, to LLC their business. So it's one of those conferences where it's like more so like an unconference model where, and, and we were intentional about that because many people, you know, we go to a lot of these conferences where it's like all day from nine to five and you know, like you're tapped out by like 12 o'clock, you know? Yeah. So you can pick and choose on which you want to be a part of. Do you want to be a part of the policy breakfast? Do you want to be a part of, you know, the kind of family feud? Um, do you want to just sit in on a debate? You know, do you want to just go to the, you know, the screening, you know? So it's, it's one of those things where like it's multiple things to do where you can just like, you know, tap in and out of. And it's happening at Temple University, um, September the 27th through the 29th. Okay. And um, the 27th, the policy breakfast is going to be at um, the Doubletree downtown. And the conference that Saturday is going to be at Temple. And the film festival is going to be at Temple. Nice. Man, that's amazing. That's so cool. And um, yeah. it was really cool to see... Um, saw the email coming today of the other films it's some incredible films um i saw yeah. weed wars one there which i think i saw like an article about that and then and you also i believe talked about weed wars at the um when a woman on the outside screened at more college of art last month mm -hmm. um in front of the show shuja Moore, his film pardon me is going to be um yeah. screening like you really boy this I was like that festival part and like, and Crystal named the festival, right? I named the festival. Exactly. So I was like, boy, I looked at, I said, well, this is a lineup. This is, um, boy, it's just, I wish I was actually surprised that we have eight submissions and I was like, oh, oh my God. Like, I just didn't want it to be about my film. So I was like, I need to For open sure. this up. Like it needs to be a film festival. Yeah. So here it is, like was at South by Southwest a few years ago. Didn't even know what South by Southwest was. And now here it is. I'm organizing a whole 
film festival here in, in Philly. So that's dope. Yeah. I, you know, you are, you, okay. So also Crystal is going to be on the cover of Love Nail Media's um, Love yeah. Nail magazine. And they're doing a launch in a few days on the 12th of September. And I'll, I'll definitely will be there. And Josh Duncan is a great f- a friend Shout of our show. Yeah. Um, she's a, she's great, a personal friend of mine too. Um, you're like a like all when people talk about Chris, I just say what a woman. Like there's like nothing you can't do, and you prove that. Like you use your 24 hours every day, girl. Like you get so much accomplished, but it's like from the heart too. On top of it, yeah. um, so for cannabis, Black Cannabis Week is the website like straightforward like BlackCannabisWeek.com. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so for cannabisweek.com everybody could go there get their tickets um and get more information all there so now we want to get into some fun questions yeah um some are fun some are like introspective you know that too so um we it doesn't have to be like a long explanation for them but like so first question we would say is if you could give advice to the younger you maybe you know 10 year old crystal or maybe even teenage wherever you felt you needed advice as a young person what would it be and why? My advice would be to slow down. Went through, I feel like I went through my 20s so fast. Like I bought my house, I was 21, I had a business, like everything just happened so fast. Like I felt like when I graduated college, I just needed, I had this checklist and I had to like check everything off this list. Like buy a house, start your business, do this, you know? And I think um, really just to just slow down and, and, and really just pace yourself. Because when I say that burnout was so dark, it was so dark. And when the world is just, you know, just giving you your accolades and, you know, just honoring you. I'm on the front page of the Delhi News. I'm on, you know, I'm being honored as a game changer by Sherry Gregg and, you know, receiving all these awards. But deep down, I was like in a dark space because, you know, I didn't know how to slow it down. Um, so I would definitely say slow, slow down. Um, and, it's, and I think that's what I'm doing currently right now. You know, now that my, my son is off to college, um, wow. this is the first time where I'm not, you know, able, like, I don't, if I don't have to cook, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't need to cook. <laughs> like, it's like empty nesting. <laughs> like, I have this empty nest and I'm in here just twirling around by myself. So for the first time, like, you know, since. I decided to, you know, care for my nephew when I was like, what, 21, 20, 22. Um, I'm able to just like really pour into me and only do what I want to do. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, my advice would for sure be to just slow down. Amazing. Wow. OK. All right. I, I shed a little tear in the inside. I was over here like, that's that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's so crazy. Josh it's- has a, a baby. I do. I have a, winter's about to be two. That's crazy. Yeah. Two? Yeah, she's about, yeah, she's about to be two. So she'll be two wow. in November. Um, you said college. Well, even like as you were just, I'm flashing back to the documentary again, but seeing those stages of just like growth and development of your son, I was like, I was like, this is crazy. Like it's, it happened so fast, right? You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like I can even say from her, even this, this whole year for her, like she did summer school and all this other stuff. And I just watched her blossom from this, person who was super dependent on us to being a little bit independent. You know what I mean? Like wanting to do things her way, wanting to eat what she wants to eat, wanting to to run her schedule when she wants to run it. So like, I can only imagine now you saying like, you know, he's off to college. I'm like, I I don't even know if I'd be ready for that. (laughs) Yeah. I would be like a mess. I'd be an absolute mess. Yeah, yeah, people nice. are asking me like, "Oh, so you want to have your own?" I'm like, "No, nope, right now, this is my time. I'm, I'm yeah, this my is for me." <laughs> I know that's right. I love that. Oh man, I love that. All right, so next, our next question is: the, you can kind of answer this. Uh, I'm, I'm not going. I'm just gonna give it to you. You answer it how you want to. Is there a software or a tool that has made your life easier? Um, what was it, or what is it, and how has it helped? Honestly, notes on my phone. Like I put mm-hmm. everything in notes with those bullet points. I used to try to do like the posters, but I'd be so want to go that it's it's really just utilizing what's in my phone. That's free, you know, and that's where all my to do lists are. I'm now doing my my gratitude journal in there at night. Mm-hmm. Um, so starting to like just practice like gratitude. So I just love that 
my notes and I, you know, you can create the different folders. Yeah. So my church notes is in there. When I'm in church, I'm writing, you know, no, notes for the Bible. So it's really notes that I just been consistent before I, I try like many other like softwares and um, like to keep me organized, yeah. but it's really the consistency is really in notes. That's dope. That's said mm-hmm. Apple also has like a journal app that just came out with. I, I'm just saying it because I use it too to like write oh. down like my emotions and stuff for the day and, and whatnot. Oh, can so you lock you it? Pictures. Yeah, you can lock it. Good. Because that's yeah. <laughs> I so, just saying some stuff and I need yeah. to <laughs> I'm just saying you can, you can, you can add pictures. Yeah, it gives you prompts and stuff based off the stuff you're talking about. So you can okay. also lock it. Oh. So I, I saw that feature. I was like, yeah, let me, let me shift over real quick. Is it an app or? Yeah, it's um. I, th- I think if you update your phone, it's called Journal, and it gives you a reminder okay. if you haven't written it in your day. It's like, hey, you know, it's eight o'clock. If you want to write to me, be be my guest type of thing. Oh, it's I cool. love that. Yeah, I'm gonna check it out. Yeah. I'm definitely going to upgrade um, just for that because I, I I'm you know I got an old. Phone. I know you are the same. That's a big that's Ooh, a big move. <laughs> I got an iPhone 11, and I'm always so scared it's gonna be that upgrade that's gonna kill it. But mm-hmm. this, a new one should be dropping soon, and I, I commit us. I'm getting a new phone because. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this my the camera ain't what it I be at I be at all the good concerts and then I be like this footage is trash like it ain't as good it ain't good all right so um speaking of concerts let's talk about music right if there was an album or even just the song to describe where you are in life now what would it be and why oh is I've been listening I've been heavy on my gospel oh my gosh. Like as I'm empty nesting, now I can blast my gospel without you know my nephew interfering with his rap. Um, so I've been, um, what is it? I think it's called "Deserve." You deserve, like mm-hmm. yeah, you deserve. I forgot mm-hmm. who the artist is, but I've been blasting it. We going I'm gonna look it up real quick. And I'm, I'm, listen, to I'm a, look it up right I'm now. I'm a church yeah. gospel gospel kid, so let me see. Yes, it's called "You Deserve," and it brings tears to my eyes. You deserve um, gospel song. And JJ uh, Harrison? Cecily Hennigan? Is it Cecily? Hold on, let me say. Crystal Rucker? Mm-mm, not Crystal. I would have remembered that one. Yes. Hey, well, well, JJ Harrison and You Full Praise? You Hold deserve on. it. It's probably a few. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably a, a, a common one that people re, re- saying. I'll send it to y'all. Okay. okay. Please, please. That's how, like, No Weapon, Fred Hammond, No Weapon, for that, that joint. Every hey, time I hear that. I did too. Straight tears. Straight tears. Um, all right, another really good one that we love. If you could sit down with any one person, any person in the world for one hour, who would it be and why? I would say my grandfather. Uh, yeah, my grandfather passed away, um, and he actually owned a church in South Philly. Just recently, I just been like tapping into my uncles and my aunts, and just trying to like reengage that church. Um, But I would love to just learn, like, what he wanted, like, you know, to see happen, you know, with that church. Because right now, it haven't been in service probably since, like, 2018. So I would definitely say my grandfather. Um, I also, you know, I used to, like, where do I get this entrepreneurial spirit? Because it's not my mom, it's not my dad. Um, And it's really my grandfather, but I, I didn't have as much time, you know, to sit down with him to learn from his experiences so I, I really been like lately just thinking about like, you know, I wish I would have had more time with him to just learn more just about my family. You know, it, it's so much um, unanswered questions that w- we have because, you know, we haven't had those hard conversations. So definitely just been thinking about him um, a lot lately and seeing how I can like, you know, like continue, you know, his legacy, you know, with this church and what he wanted to see, because even like with, The prison, like, I didn't mention this at first, but like my, you know, his church had like a prison ministry. And and I remember that, you know, as a kid, you know, going to his church, you know, he used to allow for my my father to call his church on Sunday. So it's like, you want to talk to your dad? Go to church. So it's like, okay, let me go to church so I can talk to my dad, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's where I get like a lot of, you know, just my motivation from without me even just knowing. So I would for sure want to, you know, see how I can talk to him again and just see how we can, you know, further his legacy. That's dope. Wow. That's, That's your dope. um your mom's dad or your dad's dad? Yeah, it's my mom's dad. Huh. So um, I kind of feel like you answered this one already. Um, when mm-hmm. you like, so this is one we have in here. I'm like, is this the fun part? I don't know. 
Um, it says, <laughs> has your, cause it's kind of like, is it a fun question? It's like, has your ultimate goal and what you're doing changed? If so, how? Has it changed? Like, I feel like I went through many different changes. Yeah, I went through many changes. And I don't know what's next. I just know that, you know, God is using me as a vessel. So it may change. Like I don't, it's hard for me to take ownership of Free My Weed Man because I don't think that this will be a forever thing. Like, you know, if we legalize cannabis and let everybody out of prison, okay, my work is done, you yes. know? So after that, it's like, what's next? Um, it has changed over the years. It has evolved. But when I look back, a lot of it is still rooted in the work that I've already done. Like I went to school for criminal justice. I was a social worker. Like everything was like planned and happened the way it was supposed to. Um, but I'm pretty sure, you know, I'll be onto something else in like a few years after Free My Weed Man. Once we free everybody that's locked up for cannabis. That's right. <laughs> I know that's right. And, and what does it mean um, to you to be a disruptor? Being a disruptor is being authentic to yourself, um, going against, you know, the societal norms, not not giving up. You know, it, it gets hard when you're a disruptor in, in certain energy, I mean, in certain industries. So just keep going and, and having like that faith that like whatever it is that you are disrupting is, is, is for the greater good. So... Yeah, going against societal norms to do, like disrupt that. some systems. <laughs> I like that. I feel like mm -hmm. to your to your point to the last one too. Like your your progress as a, a truly a creative disruptor is that you started with one type of mindset and it has evolved through different projects. And to your point, God has been using you in different avenues and different stages of your life to even get to this point. So I'm I'm excited to continue to watch the evolution. Um, you know that if you ever need support, you got us on this side of disruptors to be able to, you know, show up for you as well. Yes. So I just want to thank you for that. I'm just sharing your story with everybody who's 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 here and listening to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. That's so I mean, just inspirational. It's I never knew that about your grandfather. It's like you truly are carrying on a ministry. Like you mm -hmm. do God's work. Like you do God's work, man. Mm -hmm. And it's it's crazy with the doc being so vulnerable and you see the work where you're in this position where when people see the documentary, they know like, oh, she's the real deal because she doesn't just talk about it. She's lived it on both sides from you being a social worker to ended up having a social worker for your nephew when you were going through the process of adoption. So it's just, boy, um, where can people follow you and keep up with your work? Yeah, so currently follow me on Free My Weed Man um, on all platforms. The website, if you want to get any streetwear brand, it's freemyweedman.com. On Instagram, it's freemyweedman. Um, on my personal page, is Critty underscore B. So that's K-R-I-T-T-Y underscore B. Man, thank Crystal, once again, thank you for joining us. And I feel like they're going to get a lot of a lot of value, value and a lot of um, gems and also a lot of inspiration to whatever they're doing to keep pushing, you know, because it's never work is never easy for anyone. But boy, I swear you max out those 24 hours in the day, girl, you do like you boy, you work. You work. <laughs> you do. Before this, like I was driving, I, I went up to Harrisburg. I came back down from Harrisburg. I, I stopped, you know, on the way. I took therapy in a car. Then I was like, oh my God, I got to go back. I got a podcast. So yeah, I'll be over here working. I'm but, telling you, you know, this, this, this go round really putting wellness first. Like I, please, before, you know, I was like going nonstop and, you know, not pouring into myself. So, Disco round wellness is for sure first. Like they say, you have the same 24 hours as Beyonce. It's like, don't forget that. I got no, the same don't. 24 <laughs> hours as Crystal Bush. Because, <laughs> period. She be working. She be working. Oh, man. I <laughs> Thanks, you. Mira. <laughs> Once again, thank you so much for being here. And thank you to everyone who tuned in and watched and listened. Um, man, join us for the next episode of Disruptors in the Culture. We promise to bring you people just as inspirational and amazing as crystal once again crystal thank you i can't keep i can't say thank you enough yeah, 
Can't say thank you thank enough. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. No problem. All right, y'all. We will see you later. Remember, like, subscribe, and share the podcast. Again, if we made you smile, follow the page, subscribe on the YouTube, and you will hear from us again. Take care. Peace.